Hello, I am Katrick and today I'm making this video for the Construct2 Academy. The project we are going to work with today is about isometric rendering. We do have a main character that is currently moving, the brown thingy. Enemies characters, the zombies, which are flashing right now. The flash means that they are aggroed, so they have been in range, in line of sight view of the main character and are currently following it. The main character is moving into an isometric grid and as you can see can't move across obstacles. It would go behind and in front according to the depth. We do have several views available to us and several possibilities. In the current view I can use the arrow keys to move my camera around and I use the numeric keypad to move the main character. You can notice on the left a grid and if I press the V key to change the view I'm in grid mode only because actually this is a grid that determines the type of terrain to render, the character's positions and so on. And here is a strictly isometric view where the camera is focusing and following my character. For the current video, we are going to focus on the main character movement and player's input. For the basic isometric rendering used in this video, please refer to the previous part on the terrain rendering, as the theory will be about the same and I will fly over it quicker in this video as it is not my main subject. We do have our grid setup. We want to create place the tile player object in the tile layer. This is handled in the start player function. Notice the instance variables that compose the object. There is the TX and TY which are grid coordinates. We also find dest X and dest Y those are again grid coordinates and will determine the destination cell when moving the object in the grid according to the player's input. A variable direction will indicate in which direction the character is supposed to move. It will also be used to determine what animation to display on our projection object. Indeed, the sprite is composed of eight animations, one per direction. All those need to be handled and kept in memory. This is done by using numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8 and 9. If you look at the numeric keypad, each value corresponds naturally with one of our eight directions. Some isometric games inputs only allow you to go into four directions. I chose, in this example, to allow for eight directions instead. Moreover, the input and logic of input is thought to be applied to the projection. It means that when I'm going up in the projection layer, visually I do have my character going straight up to the next cell that is positioned on top of the current cell. But if we look at this movement from the tile layer's grid's perspective, going up is actually going to the cell that is top left from the current cell. This is due to the perspective of the projection. Keep that in mind, we will go back to it later. A Boolean instance variable moving, set to false by default, will allow us to know whether the tile player object is supposed to be currently moving and so not accepting further inputs for now or not. If you decide to manually set your level, don't forget to set the TX and TY values for this object, it is the starting position for it. In the code, enemies are created next, having their own tile enemy object, several instances created in the layer tile, as many as there are enemies. The logic on that point is pretty much the same, although the tile enemy object has a bit more instance variables and behaviors. We will focus on it later, but the idea is the same. Pick a random empty tile instance of our grid 
and place a tile enemy on it that is going to be the starting point for the enemy. Fill the TX and TY value to keep a trace of the starting grid coordinates. Now for the projection themselves. The creation placing is handled in the function position characters projection start. Let's focus on the approach player itself, placed to the appropriate land instance position in event 19. If you check the approach player object at that point, the graphics used are characters by Clint Belanger, released on opengameart.org. Each animation's name starts with a direction, an underscore, and a state, either idle or walk. Notice also that in each animation, the origin point is situated about the same position around the feet, so it will fit with the land objects. The collision polygon is a full-blown rectangle. Importing the animation frames from the approach character into the sprite object accordingly was kind of a repetitive ordeal, but it was necessary. Importing all frames from a sprite sheet and removing the non-appropriate directions frames from the current animation and setting the speed, loop, values for each animation. Now, if you go into the on start of layout event, you can see an array being filled with values into several columns. One of these columns concerns the direction name, dear name column. The capital letters and wording is exactly the same. This will be important to play the appropriate animation. Notice we also fill a couple of columns with different values, minus one and plus ones. The values ISO and your values. In a grid, you can check for the cells around the main cell by adding or removing a value to its X and or Y grid coordinates. A top left cell is at X minus 1, Y minus 1 compared to a main cell. A down right cell is at X plus 1, Y plus 1. The cell directly to the left is at X minus 1, Y 0 and so on. As mentioned earlier, the coordinates of the cells in regards to the tile layer and the player's inputs are different than what you'd normally expect in a grid. Again, this is because the player has to move in the projection layer, not the tile layer. As for instance variables, the approach player contains two variables, approach speed x, approach speed y. Both will be used to determine the x horizontal and y vertical speed when moving the projection around from a land instance to another in the appropriate amount of time. At the end of the position characters projection start function, we have a few functions executed in a row. We already saw set scroll in the previous video. Let's focus on set z player now. It is the event 55. The goal of that function is to organize the order of rendering of the sprites displayed on screen so that by placing some sprite behind or in front of some others, we end up with an impression of depth. To do so, for the approach player object, we select pick all the instances of land obstacle which are overlapping the approach player object. Remember, the collision polygon is far greater than the actual graphic image itself. From this pool of selected instances, we take the closest one. And depending on their respective Y values, layout position in pixels, we determine whether the approach player object must be placed in front or behind the land obstacle. Now let's focus on the main character movement itself. Input is handled from event 26 to 36. First event executes every tick and is resetting the value of the global variable input to zero. Then, if a direction key, numeric keyboard, is pressed, the input value is modified. Event 36, if the input value has been modified, we go to the move player function. We notice this function will only trigger if the value of the boolean variable moving of the tile player object is false. If the value is true, the main character is already moving currently, we just ignore the input for now. Otherwise, we check what value is written by the function 
is obstacle free. As the name of the function can let you guess, the purpose is to return a value if the next cell in the direction inputted by the player does not contain an obstacle and is in the boundaries of the grid. We want to stay in the boundaries of the grid at all time. See the 8 tier array in on start of layout we talked about earlier, that is where those values are stocked and all around the project the values are called. Check whether the values used from an array is calling for a while value of dear values or dear values iso. That's where the different values are used. If you look closely at the condition of the function is obstacle free, the explanation will make sense. If we can move our main character, we set the moving boolean variable value to true. We remember the direction value from the input value, as well as the logical coordinates for the destination cell in dest x and dest y, and set the moving speed for the approach player object accordingly to the visible part of our land instances. If we cannot move the character, we make the approach player and tile player both flash for a while as feedback for the player. At this point, if the main character is to move, then the boolean variable moving of the tile player object is set to true. That's what event 49 checks. Notice we start by setting the Z order for our player. We have made our checks in the grid to see if the cell in the direction wanted was free and in the boundaries. The actual movement happens in the projection layer. Land and tile instances are picked accordingly, dest X and dest Y logical coordinates. The approach player is moved from several pixels and then its position is tested. If the approach player sprite is within a 20 pixel range of the origin point of the destination land instance for the movement, we consider stopping the movement there. If not, next execution tick, we will again move the approach player sprite accordingly. When arrived on destination, all values used are reset by setting them to minus one. Tile player is moved to the destination cell in the tile layer. Moving is set to false. Approach player is moved from in the range of the land origin point to exactly at the position of the destination land origin point in the layer projection. The next sub-events check whether the main character is still moving or not and play the appropriate animation, walk or idle, according to its current state of movement. At that point, if the user is setting a new input on the next tick, a check will be made to see if the destination cell in the direction is free or not and the movement will be set or not. To sum up, the player determines a direction in which to move thanks to its keyboard input. The destination cell is checked in regards to this input, absence of obstacles in the cell, the destination cell being in the boundaries of the grid and the object not being moved currently. Depending on the previous checks and, if possible, the projection object is moved to the determined cell. On destination, the input is scanned again to determine the next cell where to move. That is the basic ID and theory for grid movement and it is applied to the main character and demonstrated in the projection layer. Next video, we will focus on the enemies themselves and provide them with a simple AI. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Don't hesitate to check out some of the other Constructor Academy material. Thank you for watching. Thank you.